Well, I know it's hard to not mentally check out uh, about this time, so kind of try to stay with it for the next couple of days. Um, I don't want you to completely forget about photosynthesis uh, between now and when you come back. So we will have a reading quiz when you come back. It's on pages 155 through 168, um, up to the alternative methods of uh, mechanisms of carbon fixation. Those last couple of pages are the pages I told you that I would do some bonus questions on for the next exam. I think the next exam is April 18th or something like that. So we've got about two full weeks of class before another exam coming up and get back from break. Um, as far as your enzyme presentation, um, when you get back, that is worth 50 points. Check the syllabus. And one of the things Dr. Morton wanted to really um, urge you to do is, as you get together with your lab partner and start preparing your presentation, there are a set of very explicit instructions in your lab handout about what has to be in the presentation, uh, what the responsibilities are, what kind of things you should address. Please take those seriously and follow those instructions carefully because when he grades those, there will be a little check sheet and if you don't do things, you will miss points. Um, anything you want to elaborate yeah, exactly. on? Exactly. I have, I have a little rubric, you know, and it's, as you go through your presentation, you know, if you've, if you've done things adequately, that gets checked. If something's missing, then you don't get you know, those points. So be careful. This is on pages, I think it's 4 and 5, where it says specifically what's in each of the sections that should go into the presentation. Be sure to read those carefully. And obviously, that last one where it talks about doing a, uh, a poster is to do that. But for, but for example, this week in lab, you're going through all the headache of having to average your trials of your data. And then if during your presentation you don't use that information, but you use all your raw data instead, you will miss some points because you haven't followed instructions and you're not doing what you're supposed to do. So um, kind of check those off as you do them in your lab handout. Okay? Okay, so we are going to possibly wrap up photosynthesis today. Remember what the challenge is for these organisms that evolved that were able to, for the first time, transform sunlight energy into chemical energy. What they had to do is they had to somehow harness the energy of those photons of light and turn it into chemical bond energy. And one of the real key aspects of all of this, number one, is being able to absorb that light. When we talk about pigment molecules and how pigment molecules like chlorophyll have a structure, a lot of double bonds in that porphyrin ring, which facilitate photons of light being absorbed. And what happens when those photons are absorbed? Electrons get excited. Okay, electrons are pushed up to a higher energy level, to a higher orbital, if you like. And when they're up at that higher energy level, they're unstable. So what do those unstable electrons tend to do? Described by the second law of thermodynamics, become stable again. Fall back down to ground state. And when they do, they emit light in the form of fluorescence and a little bit of heat. That doesn't get the autotrophic organism any gain. They haven't harnessed that energy yet in the form of chemical bond energy. But if those pigments are part of a structure, a chloroplast, which has some membranes associated with it, then some interesting things can start happening. And when those electrons get excited and they get boosted up to higher energy level, there are mechanisms that evolve that allow that energy to be trapped and converted into chemical bond energy. So that's what we need to dig in and kind of see how that works. We also talked about the fact that in the membranes of the chloroplast, what are those membranes called? <coughs> Balacoid membranes, okay? That there are organizational units that the photosynthetic pigments are grouped into. And we call them <coughs> photosystems, photosystem one and photosystem two. 
And as it turns out, there's going to be some cooperation and some interaction between those two photosystems and photosynthesis. Those photosystems consist of several hundred pigment molecules. And some of them are chlorophylls, but others are accessory pigments. The kind of guts of the photosystem is a special molecule of chlorophyll called the reactive center. So what do all of those other accessory pigments do? Basically, they're absorbing photons of light and funneling that energy in toward the reactive center. So the presence of those accessory or antenna pigments helps to gather a bunch of different wavelengths of light and all kind of funnel it toward that one heart molecule where some really interesting things start taking place. Ultimately, the electrons are going to, during photosynthesis then, be moved from water molecules and eventually they're going to go to reduce NADP and eventually the NADP is going to be used to reduce CO2 to glucose. So the flow of electrons is from water to reduce NADP and ultimately those end electrons end up in glucose. It's really the reverse of what happens in cell respiration. In respiration, the electrons are part of a glucose molecule and end up being picked up by oxygen to make water molecules. So those two processes are kind of really kind of the reverse of one another. Okay. So, little review. The following is true. It's pigment, right? Chlorophyll has this porphyrin ring where the double bonds are and the hydrocarbon tail. And the hydrocarbon tail helps to anchor those chlorophyll molecules into the phallocoid <coughs> membrane. So all of those are true statements. What's fluorescence? In order for fluorescence to occur, the light has to be absorbed. And so one and two are out. Does this require membranes to occur? No. If I take leaves and extract the pigment by grinding them up in alcohol, and I have this flask of chlorophyll, if I shine light on it, it will fluoresce. The electrons in those chlorophyll molecules will be excited, go to an excited state, and then drop back down to ground state and emit that fluorescent light. So four is the correct answer. It's the light that's emitted. Okay. Here is a kind of mechanical representation of what happens in the interaction of the two photosystems that make up the process of the light-dependent reaction of photosynthesis. So it's really important for you to understand, number one, that we're only talking about part of photosynthesis now, the light-dependent phase. So these would be thalicoid membrane-associated processes. So remember what's associated with the light-dependent phase. Water is going to be split. NADP is going to be reduced. ATP is going to be produced. And oxygen is going to be released as a byproduct. Okay? Well, what happens is that these two photosystems cooperate with one another and kind of move electrons from one photosystem to another. This little base down right here for the tower represents the reactive center of photosystem two and photosystem one. So in these photosystems, there's a chlorophyll molecule. And when it gets stimulated by a photon of light, that electron gets boosted up to a higher energy level. Okay, So it's like this construction worker with his mallet you know, hitting this lever and boosting this electron up to a higher energy level. Now, if there's nothing up here to catch the electron, it's just going to fall back down to its ground state again. That would be the fluorescence. That wouldn't get us anything. Okay? Well, what happens in this particular case is when a photon of light is absorbed and funneled toward the reactive center, that that electron gets grabbed by some kind of a compound that is associated with the photosystem. We'll give some names to these later on. So this compound, what's happening to it? It's becoming reduced, right? 
Okay. If another photon of light strikes another chlorophyll molecule, and that electron goes to ground state, what's going to happen? Well, if this one's already reduced, that electron's not going to have anywhere to go, nothing to grab it. So it's going to fall back down to ground state again. So in order for this to keep going, this has got to dump off its electrons somewhere else. Sound familiar? Sounds like the electron transport chain, right? And actually it is. In the thylakoid membrane, there is an electron transport chain. And it consists of those same kind of compounds that we saw in cellular respiration. Even to the point that some of those compounds accept hydrogens only and some accept electrons only. So what's going to be happening here? We're going to be making a hydrogen ion gradient as the electrons that come from photosystem 2 are dumped off to that electron transport chain. So where do they go? Well, those electrons, when they've gone through the electron transport chain, don't go to oxygen to make water. That's respiration. They instead go to photosystem one. Why? Because while this is happening, photons of light are also striking this reactive center. And they're elevating electrons. And something grabs it. Okay. This now is going to be missing an electron. If that happens over and over again, if we just keep dumping electrons up here, and this acceptor donates them to NADP to reduce it, we're going to run out of electrons in the reactive center of this photosystem pretty soon. This chlorophyll molecule is going to become entirely oxidized. And then there's nothing left, no more electrons left to excite. So what do we have to do? If we rob them from here and donate them to NADP, we've got to replace them. Where do they come? They come from the electron transport system. Where did the electron transport system get them? From photosystem two. So we've solved this problem down here of kind of depleting these electrons, which end up as part of NADP at the expense of depleting the electrons in photosystem 2. If you want to use a biblical reference, we've robbed Peter to pay Paul. Robbed Peter to pay Paul. So we're taking the electrons from here to replace these that were lost here. But now we're going to run out of electrons here. So how are we going to replace electrons to photosystem number 2? That's where the water is going to come in. And as the water molecules are split, they're going to be split into oxygen atoms, protons, and electrons. Okay, remember an electron and a proton is equal to a hydrogen. So some of these electrons are going to be used to replace these that were lost to here. So do you see how the flow of electrons is occurring? They start out in water. They're stripped off of water and stuck into here. They're boosted up here. They flow down here to this photosystem. They're boosted up here. And they ultimately end up as part of a reduced coenzyme. Along the way, since we've got an electron transport chain functioning here, we're making that hydrogen ion gradient. So we can make ATP. And what's the waste product? Oxygen atoms then bond together and form molecular oxygen. So our O2, our reduced NADP, and our ATP. So this is another example of how cellular metabolism really is just all about moving electrons around and moving them from one compound to another. And as we do so, we harness some of that quote-unquote electrical energy in the form of chemical bond energy. Okay, so here's what it looks like without all the little uh, and, you know, construction workers and things like that. So let's start out looking at photosystem number two. Photosystem number two, this is the reactive center of that photosystem. 
don't worry about this designation. This is a designation that tells you the special kind of chlorophyll molecule that's part of that reactive center. I don't really care if you know that designation or not. P680 refers to the wavelength of light that that maximally absorbs. So we've got these photons of light, and they're striking these antenna pigments, and they're kind of bumping into one another, boosting electrons from one to the other, until we hit that reactive center molecule. And then that electron becomes excited and becomes grabbed by a primary acceptor. Some molecule becomes reduced. To replenish those electrons that we're boosting up here, simultaneously water molecules are being split into protons, electrons, and oxygen atoms. And so those electrons are replenishing the ones that are being boosted up here. These electrons are donated to an electron transport chain. These are just representations of some of the names of the compounds in the electron transport chain. You see that some of these compounds are cytochromes, just like they were in the electron transport chain in respiration. And we make our hydrogen ion gradient and use that to make ATP. Remember that the process that's being used to make ATP is not oxidative phosphorylation now. This process is photophosphorylation. Those electrons flow to the reactive center of photosystem number one. Photosystem number one is also being stimulated by photons of light. Electrons are being elevated. So the loss of these electrons up here is compensated for the fact that we're always donating them from this photosystem too. What happens to these electrons? They're used to reduce NADP, forming one of the two molecules, the other being ATP, that are needed in the Calvin cycle to reduce CO2 into carbohydrate. I know it's a little confusing and it's kind of counterintuitive that when you look at this particular relationship that photosystem 2 is the one on the left and photosystem 1 is the one on the right. The way that I always tell people to remember it is that remember that photosystem 2 is associated with the splitting of water, H2O. Okay, So that will help you to kind of remember which is which. So photosystem 2 is associated with water splitting. Photosystem 1 is associated with the reduction of NADP. So again, as long as you can follow the electrons. They started here, they went here, they went here, they went here, here, and ultimately ended up here. That has allowed us to convert that kinetic energy of light into a form of chemical energy. So we've now transferred our light energy into chemical energy. Um, here's a representation of what things look like now when you start throwing in the uh, chloroplast. And this would represent the membrane, the thylakoid membrane. Remember all those little stacked membranes in the stroma? So this white part of the slide out here would represent the stroma. This would represent the space that the membrane encloses. So this is the thylakoid space. This is the stroma. That's our two compartments that the thylakoid membrane separates. If we've got two compartments in a membrane, we've got the ability to establish a hydrogen ion gradient. And if we can establish a hydrogen ion gradient, we can potentially tap that to make ATP. The thylakoid membrane does have an ATPase molecule, a channel protein, through which protons can travel. There's a little bit different relationship here. Do you remember how many protons it took to make an ATP in respiration going through the ATPase? It took two, right? 
every two protons you can make an ATP. In cellular resp in, in photosynthesis, for every three protons that go through the channel protein, we can make an ATP. You'll also notice that the orientation of the gradient is backwards from what it was in respiration. Okay, in respiration, we made a high hydrogen ion concentration up here in that phallocoid space, and we had a lower concentration in the matrix, and then the protons flow this way. In photosynthesis, the high hydrogen ion concentration builds up in this space, this phallocoid space. The low concentration is in the matrix, so protons flow out of the space and into the stroma. I said matrix, into the stroma. So the gradients are backwards from one another. So this is a little bit nicer representation showing you pretty much the same thing. And so here's our stroma out here. It's low proton concentration. Here's our phallocoid membrane. Here is our high hydrogen ion concentration in the space of the phallocoid. Here's our electron transport chain. And here are our two photosystems, photosystem two and photosystem number one. So as this electron transport chain <coughs> is functioning, what are we doing? We're pumping protons from the stroma into this thalicoid space. We're building a high hydrogen ion concentration up here. And then as those protons flow through the channel protein back to their low concentration, we're making ATP by photophosphorylation. One thing I want to point out is that during this process of building up a hydrogen ion gradient, there are actually three events that are going to contribute to that formation of the gradient. And this is one of the steady guide questions. This is one of the things you should be able to articulate and explain on an exam question. So remember, what do we want to do? We want to build up high H pluses here and low H pluses out here. So what are the three events? One is the electron transport chain. And the fact that there are two types of carriers in the electron transport chain. Some molecules accept hydrogens, some electrons only. And that those carriers are asymmetrically distributed. So if you've got that for cellular respiration, you've got it for photosynthesis. It's the same principle. Another event that occurs is the splitting of water in the stroma. So those photons of light energy are being used to break apart water molecules. Electrons are being used to replace those lost from this reactive center. Oxygen molecules are combining with one another, oxygen atoms, sorry, to form oxygen molecules. And then there's some protons left. Okay? So they accumulate in the thalicoid space. I said the strong, sorry. They accumulate in the thalicoid space. as water is being split. So that tends to add protons to this high level right here. The third event is the reduction of NADP 
that's happening in the stroma out here. So to reduce NADP, you need both electrons and protons. Where are the electrons coming from? Photosystem 1. Where are the protons coming from? The stroma. So this is going to be depleting protons, lowering that concentration. Splitting of water is going to add protons to this pool, as will the electron transport system. So as long as we have this gradient, this high concentration here and this low concentration here, we can keep making ATP. What happens when the sun stops shining? Photons of light are no longer exciting reactive centers. Electron flow stops. Water stops being split. No ATP is being produced because we have depleted our hydrogen ion gradient. We're not maintaining it. And we don't reduce NADP. Without those things, the light independent reactions then can occur and we can't make glucose. So, the last part of the process, and one that is, in reality, fairly complicated, and we're going to kind of simplify it a great detail, are the light-independent reactions of the Calvin cycle. This is where the process of carbon dioxide fixation occurs. That term fixation refers to the fact that the CO2 molecule is being trapped or fixed in the form of an organic molecule. Probably a better word for it really is CO2 reduction. And what do we need to make that happen? To reduce something, we need a source of electrons. And we need a source of energy because this reaction of CO2 fixation is endergonic. CO2 is low energy, glucose is high energy. So we need an input of energy to make that happen. So these reactions require these products from these reactions. If we don't have these available, carbon dioxide fixation doesn't occur. What do we need to make carbon dioxide fixation? A fresh supply of CO2. and the enzymes that are present in the stroma, which will catalyze these reactions of this cyclical process called the Calvin cycle. Don't these particular products of this particular light reaction have to be recycled for this to continue? Yeah, okay. We need ADP to make ATP. Where can it come from? the ATP breakdown that occurs in this process. We need oxidized coenzymes. Where do we get those? From the oxidation of these products of this reaction. So in some respects, you can think of the Calvin cycle as kind of the recycling step that allows these light reactions to continue. Fortunately, in this recycling process, we make carbohydrate. Another thing that's important to appreciate about cycles, and hopefully you uh, appreciated this from the citric acid cycle, is that cycles always have to regenerate their starting compounds. So basically, what we feed into the cycle is pulled out 
but the rest of the cycle has got to keep maintaining itself. So if I make a six carbon <coughs> sugar using the Calvin cycle, how many carbons of how many molecules of CO2 does it require? Car six, right? So you've got to balance what you feed in and what you come at, what comes out if this cycle is going to continue to be self-regenerating. Now, the biochemistry of the Calvin cycle is kind of a nightmare. Dr. Morton shaking his head yes, you know. Yeah, it's, it's much more complicated than this simple representation indicates. We're not going to get into all the detail of the biochemistry of the Calvin cycle. <clears throat> there are a couple of compounds, though, that you do need to be aware of. And one of these is this starting compound, if you like, RUBP. RUBP is shorthand for ribulose bisphosphate. Basically, it's a five carbon sugar. This is the molecule that initially grabs CO2 that's entering the Calvin cycle. So this is kind of the starting point, if you like, of the Calvin cycle. Another compound that you should be aware of is this one right here, G3P. G3P stands for glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And it's a three carbon sugar. <clears throat> you have heard of this compound before. But you probably don't remember where. Glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is one of the intermediate compounds in glycolysis. Eventually, glucose will be converted into glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and then later on that will be converted into pyruvate. The significance of that is, is that if glucose can be used to make this in cellular respiration, is it unreasonable to believe that metabolically a plant couldn't take this compound and convert it back into glucose? The answer is yes. Okay. So this G3P is kind of, in some respects, kind of a half a glucose molecule. Another thing you should be aware of is RUBP carboxylase. So what kind of a molecule is this? What's it doing? What do you know about it immediately by looking at it? It's an enzyme, okay? And what does RUBP stand for? That's its substrate. This guy right here, this five carbon sugar. And what does a carboxylase enzyme do? Remember what a decarboxylase did? It removed carbon in the form of CO2. A carboxylase enzyme adds carbon from CO2. So this is the enzyme that grabs CO2 and sticks it onto that five carbon sugar in the Calvin cycle. This is really an important enzyme. And in fact, there is some speculation that this might be the most prevalent enzyme in the world. Now, if you choose to look at the um, alternative mechanisms of carbon fixation before the next exam to get some of those bonus questions, there's going to be another enzyme you're going to encounter. And that's an enzyme called RUBP oxygenase. What is oxygenase going to do? It's going to add oxygen onto this RUBP, not CO2. And that 
oxygenase enzyme is going to oxidize, break up if you like, our UVP. Is that good? Yeah, that's not good for the Calvin cycle. So one of the issues you'll see in that particular section is when is this enzyme active and when is this enzyme active? One of the things that it's going to depend upon is the relative levels of O2 and CO2. Okay, I don't want you to get too caught up in the detail of this, but I do want you to show you this abbreviated representation of the Calvin cycle so you can get some kind of an idea of what's going on. I'm not going to hold you responsible for a lot of this detail, but I want you to see some of the key elements of this. What this representation is going to show you is what happens as three CO2s enter this particular cycle. So we've got three CO2s coming in. So what eventually is going to have to come out? Three carbons, right? And those three carbons will be in the form of this G3P molecule. Half of glucose. Okay. In order to grab three molecules of CO2, we need three molecules of this RUBP. Make sense? Okay. And that reaction is catalyzed by this enzyme, RUBP carboxylase, or it's also called Rubisco. So what happens? Three CO2s glom on to three of these five carbon sugars, and we form three molecules of this very short-lived intermediate. We're not even going to give it a name, okay? That particular molecule is going to immediately be converted into six molecules of three carbon. So basically, this is going to be chopped in half. So we have six molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. If you add up carbons, the number of carbons still matches. Because how many carbons do we have here? 3 times 5 is 15, right? 3 coming in, that's 18. Six molecules of 3 carbons, that's 18. Okay, so carbons add up. So this first step is what's referred to basically as the carbon fixation step. So the CO2 is no longer inorganic. It is now part of, an, carbons are now part of an organic molecule. CO2 has become fixed. 3-phosphoglycerate is then going to be converted into something else in the Calvin cycle. It's going to be converted into this compound. You don't have to know its name. 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. But what's the key point to understand here? We've added some phosphate groups to this, right? Where do they come from? They come from ATP. Where did that ATP come from? The light-dependent reaction of photosynthesis. This molecule is then reduced into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Reduction requires what? Electrons. Where do the electrons come from? Reduced NADP. And in the process, NADP becomes oxidized again. Now we've got glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. We've still got our 18 carbons. 15 plus 3 is 18. What are we going to do now? Basically, we're going to pull three carbons out of this cycle in the form of this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The half of glucose. So now we're back down to 15 carbons again. Oops. So what happens to those 15 carbons? They've got to be rearranged back into three molecules of this again, 15 carbons, so the process can continue. Now, in reality, this isn't this nice cyclical representation. There are all these side pathways and things like that, but uh, this is good enough for our understanding. This recycling process requires some additional ATP. 
Well, that only represents half of glucose. So basically, this has got to happen one more time again to make a full glucose. Now, I'm not going to get as hung up as I did last time. Actually, the last exam didn't have that much on there. About accounting for numbers of ATP and reduced NADP. But just kind of start adding things up again. For half a glucose, what does it require? It requires 9 ATP. So for a full glucose, 18 ATP are required to make that glucose molecule. We also require 6 times 2 or 12 reduced NADP. So those light dependent reactions are going to have to be cranking out a lot of product for this Calvin cycle to keep going on. Don't get all hung up in terms of numbers of carbons and things here. It's just for illustrative purposes. But I wanted you to understand that carbon numbers do have to balance. And if we stick three in, we need to take three out if this cycle is going to continue to function in a sustainable fashion. So 15 carbons, three five carbon molecules, add three. And then eventually we've got to get back to that same molecule again. We've got to keep regenerating our RUBP. Once a plant has G3P, it can make all kinds of interesting things. It can make glucose. It can make fructose. It can then make sucrose, the disaccharide. If it's got some nitrogen from the soil, it can make amino acids. It can make nucleic acids. It can make fatty acids. It can make glycerol. So a plant can then metabolically, using entirely inorganic sources, carbon dioxide, water, and some minerals from the soil, the four classes of organic molecules that are needed to make cells. And once you can make cells, you can grow, repair. You've got an organism. It all depends upon this funneling of light energy into the formation of chemical bond energy, initially in these forms, but ultimately in making these sugar molecules, which are then used to make everything else that makes up a plant cell. That's photosynthesis. Okay. So there are a lot of parallels between what you've learned already about cellular respiration and the process of photosynthesis. When uh, we start our next topic, we're going to really shift gears now. And we're going to start getting into molecular genetics, DNA, RNA, transcription, translation, regulation of gene expression. And that's going to tie in very closely with what we're going to be doing in lab. We're going to be doing a lot of practical lab applications of this. Once you have completed your enzyme presentation, then the last, what, five labs are all the molecular genetics. We get a break today.